welcome to Microfiche Microphone. I'm Micah, and on this channel we look at microfiche from the past, old newspaper articles in the public domain, we look at them with our modern eyes, our modern perspective, and see what we can learn from them. In this microfiche time capsule we are looking back at the Gentleman's Magazine from March 1800, and this one is entitled Detection of Two Literary Forgeries. Uh, I thought that was interesting because, uh, first of all, how would they tell? back in those days, and second of all, if they could tell, uh, what does that mean exactly? Did somebody pretend to have written a book? Or, well, because they obviously did if there was a book there, so, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not sure what they mean by literary forgeries, if they were pretending that it's by a different author than it was. Um, so I'm interested to find out what this is about. It could be a lot of different things. So, let's find out. Mr. Urban, March 13. Your readers will recollect the account given in your volume, I can do this, hang on. L is 50, right? 59, 158, 58, 789, 903, yeah? A, of a collection of letters written in Arabic of the time of the Saracen, Sar, Sar, Saracenic Amirs and a complete translation of Libby's Roman history into that language. The first of these was attacked by a Maltese and defended by Professor Tai Chin. Tai Chin? Tai Chin? And a wish was expressed for the publication of the latter. The expectation of the literary world is now completely baffled by the detection of both of these works as forgeries. Dr. Hager, by a long residence at Palermo and attentive examination of them, decided that the whole was an imposture. The particulars of this detection are thus given it at large in Dr. Beister's Berlin Journal. Joseph Vella, a native of Malta and a titular chaplain, was at Palermo 1782 when Mohammed ben Osman, ambassador from the Emperor of Morocco, was driven in by stress of weather in his return from Naples to Me Mequinez. I'm probably butchering that. Sorry about that if you're from there. The books and monuments in the Arabic language in Sicily were shown to him, and Avella, speaking of the popular idiom of Malta, a dialect of the Arabic, served as interpreter. They frequently converted to, conversed together. Vela commenced in his own imagination a complete Arabic scholar, and his unparalleled assurance in explaining Arabic writers was only matched with the greatest suppleness in retracting his explanations <laughs> great so this guy you're you're relying on to explain it to was really good at explaining things and then taking it back five minutes later that's great he gave out that he was possessed of 17 of the lost books of Livy in Arabic a present from the Grand Master of Malta to whom they had been given by a Frenchman who took it from a shelf in the church of is that Saint? Saint Sophia at Constantinople. I don't know what the STA stands for, but I'm assuming it's Saint. It had often been asserted that Livy's history was preserved entire in Arabic, either in Constantinople, the Isle of Chios, or Fez. Vela was, however, too circumspect to expose his MS by printing it, though the Dowager Lady Spencer, then on a tour through Italy, offered to display... Dis, disray? Hmm. The expense of printing. Whatever that's supposed to mean. Defray? I think it's defray. Yep. The expenses of printing. At length he published an Italian translation of the 60th book by way of specimen in one oct octavo page, being only the epitome ascribed to Florus, which to deceive which so deceived the professor of oriental languages that he republished it with the following introduction, what is here communicated of the Arabic translation of Livy will be particularly acceptable. The monks of St. Martin near Palermo purchased in 1744 five Arabic M manuscripts MSS, yeah, from the heirs of Don Martino La Farina, who in the last century carried several with him from Spain to Palermo. These were also shown to the ambassador, and V fixed on one of them to impose it on the world as a genuine Arabic collection 
of Sicilian deeds and records which he was enabled to publish by the generosity of the government, concurring with the general wishes of all classes of the people, who are more interested than most nations in the earliest part of their history. V, after the departure of the ambassador, affirmed that he had declared it to be an authentic and official correspondence between the Arabic governors in Sicily and their superiors in Africa from the first landing of the Arabians in that island, A.D. 872, and the reports of the emirs or de deputy governors in the different districts of Sicily, to the grand emir at Palermo, and his report to the muli at Kairwan, Kyr the ancient capital of Cyrenaica, Cyrenaica, and the answers, and lastly, the correspondence carried on by the Arabians and other princes of the age, popes, etc. This discovery excited the greatest attention. The Archbishop A. Roldi eagerly promoted the publication of the code, which does not really contain anything about Sicily, the Amirs, the Muli, or any political subject. <laughs> yeah, that's strange too, isn't it? He loaded with favor the discoverer and explainer of it, who received still greater from the king. He was appointed abbot of St. Pancras with an annual revenue of 1,200 ducats, the professor of Arabic with a suitable salary, beside a bene benefice worth 250 scudi a month and presents from persons consulting him on oriental antiquities. He pretended to correspond with the ambassador for a clearer explanation of the code, which contained only 279 of 410 leaves. I think that's what that means. Only 279, 410. I don't think they mean 279,410. 279 of 410? I'm not sure. After some little time appeared to him not sufficiently lucrative. He pretended to discover a more complete copy at Fez, and the king was induced to order a sum of money to defray the expenses of a voyage thither, which was suspended by the continual receipt of extracts and copies of papers from his correspondence, and even a new collection of state papers relative to the Norman period of the history of Sicily. His translations were continued, and the archbishop, at the expense of 2,000 ounces, printed the Codus Diplomatico de Sicilia sotto il governo delgi Arabi. I'm sorry about my Latin. I'm horrible at Latin, so I do not speak Latin. So, in four volumes, 410, containing occurrences from 827 to 1039. Oh gosh, he got in really deep, didn't he? Okay, two more volumes were ready to continue it to the very last year of the Arabic period. The manuscript at St. Martin's Abbey, treating really of Mohammed and not of Sicily, was artfully disguised and disfigured by V, and specimens of his character engraved, which excited admin administration, admiration, okay, which excited admiration of the man who could decipher these new and controvertible species of Arabic character. The very paper on which they, they were written, though merely made of rags, became a subject of controversy. The five facsimiles of papal letters inserted in Part 2, Volume 1, page 244 to 261, are absolute fictions, not traceable in the manuscripts. Yet some foreign literati affirmed that they had been so happy as to dis, uh, decipher these five leaves and found them all correspond with the translation. V himself affirmed that intense application had deprived him of one eye, and so excited the compassion of the late Pope. What? He lost an eye? Like that? Casually mentioned it on the side there? That is okay. <clears throat> In order to preserve such a treasure, he had gold bearer's skin, gold beater's skin, glued over every page. What does that mean? And he never returned the code to the abbey, but pretended he had been robbed of it and contracted a violent fever from the fright when the interrogatories of the criminal court put to every person on his house being robbed, proved that the day before the pretended robbery, he sent off a large chest. He spent 10 years between the first and last volume of his publication in reading and examining all history and records relative to his forgery. The German reviews puffed the work, the extracts were made, and translations begun into Latin, English, and French, and the German translation by Professor Hausleutner 
at Stuttgart extended two of the original volumes into four. In Italy, textbooks of Sicilian history and explanation of its ancient geography were taken from it. The charters and state papers were copied into works of importance by the several antiquaries. These egregious, ridiculous errors were overlooked. <laughs> this one's longer than I thought. And borrowed. His Arabic was copied for the use of learners. Dr. Hager, born of Austrian parents at Milan during his residence at Palermo, became convinced that the whole was a forgery. He committed his arguments to paper and presented them to the King of Naples, who invited him from Vienna to take a second examination at Palermo, where he stayed from December 1794 to December 1796, and having got the manuscript into his hands and stripped off the goldbeater's skin, detected the recent insertions and found that the pretended code was no more than a history of Muhammad and his family, and that the fictitious coins were not struck, but cast, and the counterfeit correspondence said to have been carried off by the robbers in disguise when V produced fixed leaves of the pretended supplements transmitted from Morocco, he found they were written on Genoese paper, such as is sold at Palermo. <laughs> Great. The Norman Code, notwithstanding the improbability that the laws of Count Rudiger, R Ruggiero, and Duke Robert, and the correspondent letter of the latter from with the Egyptian Fatimites should have got to Fez, was printed with the royal magnificence with the original Arabic under the title Libro del Consiglio di Egito. Horrible Latin, I'm sorry. In Arabic and Italian. A splendid folio with engravings of coins and vignettes in the neatest manner, 1793. The second volume had reached only to the 38th sheet when it was suppressed by the government as a manifest fraud. These expensive publications prevented the publishing of the Civil History of Sicily by Father Salvatore de Blasi, intended in twelve volumes for ten, for, for ten, for, for something, and three more documents and records. Questions of politics and governments were pretended to be determined by these fictitious manuscripts. Appeals were made to them to establish new and abolish old privileges, so that the Sicilian Parliament, 1794, proposed a decree that the Norman Code, that the Norman Code should not be adduced as legal authority till His Majesty, by royal proclamation, should have declared it genuine. Which motion was overruled by Corelli, the Secretary of State, whom V named on his prime assistant in framing it. Of course. On Dr. H.'s detection of it, a committee of five was named to examine V, though they understood not a word of Arabic. The forger was driven to a confession of his falsifications from and his accomplices in Malta and Sicily, still abounding with inconsistencies, yet not pretending to deny that the whole was a fraud, of which he had been the dupe. Of course he was. Monsieur von, von Muir at Nuremberg was the last to be convic convinced and even censured Dr. H for pretending to greater penetration than persons of the first rank in Sicily who had acknowledged their obligation to him for his detection. The king desired him not to print a circumstantial account with the document of V's judicial examination, all which government proposed to publish in due time, though it has not, never yet done. The ex abbot V was dismissed from all his offices and committed prisoner to the castle for 15 years. That's kind of a long sentence of forgery, I'm not going to lie. Um, that's quite a an operation he had running. So I'm just going to really quickly summarize what I understood happened. Is that this guy, V, what is his name again? Vena or something like that? Uh, Vela. Okay, so Vela... Um, got uh, claimed that he had found some sort of lost manuscripts from Constantinople and with help of some correspondence that he had helping him make his up they made up a bunch of crap and his correspondence would write to him in Arabic and he would translate it into whatever language yeah Latin or, or English or whatever and um, and he was selling these yeah and then they pointed out at some point that his quote-unquote original manuscripts were written on paper that you can buy in Palermo. Palermo. Like, dude, it's not that impressive. You're kind of messing yourself up. 
but he did this. He pulled this off for years and he pulled, like, showed these forger, forged documents as, like, real ones from history. And he sold them as such. And a lot of people fell for it before he was caught. So he mustn't have been the great, that great of a forger considering he got caught in 1800, you know? <laughs> When you're caught with your forgery in 1800 before they're able to, like, analyze things and handwriting and, like, speech patterns and things like that, like we do today. Um, and then even being able to pick out the paper that they used back then, like, that is really impressive. Um, I'm assuming people who were very familiar with the paper that should have been used during that period were the ones who picked it up on it first. But even still, that's very impressive. Like, how can you pick up a piece of paper, look at it, and say, oh, this was made in Palermo? You know what I mean? Like, I, f I consider that to be very impressive. So, good job. That was very uh, Sherlock Holmes of you to figure it out. Um, what's that dude's name that figured it out? It was some sort of German dude. Yeah. From Stuttgart. Um, Professor Hausleutner, yeah, Hausleutner, um, from Stuttgart. So, good job, Professor Hausleutner, for figuring out that they were forgeries. It is interesting that people still thought that they were real, even after they were discovered to be fake. Um, so it took some time for them to finally nail down this guy. And then when they did, they gave him 15 years house arrest. Sounds fun. No, it doesn't. But um, that's that's rather steep for forgery. Um, ex Abbot V was dismissed from all his offices and committed prisoner to the castle for 15 years. So that sounds that doesn't sound like prison to me. That sounds like house arrest. So correct me if I'm wrong. Also correct me if I completely butchered the Latin, which I'm sure I did, uh, or if I completely messed up anything else. Please let me know. Anyways. Uh, but I thought that was really interesting. I wasn't quite expecting that. I'm not sure what I was expecting. As I said at the beginning, I wasn't quite sure what it was about. But um, now that we know, that is really fascinating to me. How he got away with it for so long and how it was finally detected. Like, that is really impressive. So, good job. You know, 19th century or it's end of the 18th. And, um... Well done, and I uh, very much appreciate how much work that must have been. Anyways, um, thank you for joining us today on our Microfish Time Capsule. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I hope to see you in the next video.